Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Alicia Gabidon and I am an adult services librarian with Vaughan Public Libraries. Before we, we begin the formal program, I would like to share a few housekeeping notes. To minimize interruptions, participants will be set to mute and videos will be turned off. For accessibility, we have turned on the live transcript feature. A question and answer period will follow the lecture. Questions can be submitted anytime during the lecture via the chat function and are moderated by the co-hosts. Tonight's lecture is being recorded and will be made available on VPL's YouTube channel. I'll now pass it over to Margie Singleton to introduce tonight's lecture and our speaker. Margie. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alicia. So I'd like to welcome everyone to the latest installment on our lecture series, Reflecting on Racism and Diversity. As Alicia said, I'm Margie Singleton, and I'm the CEO of Vaughan Public Libraries. So on behalf of Vaughan Public Libraries, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that our libraries are built upon the territory and the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, um, per the Toronto Purchase Agreement, or also known as Treaty 13. We recognize that we are situated on the traditional terriers, on a terri traditional territory, excuse me, of the Huron-Wendat and the Haudenosaunee who occupied this land before the arrival of European settlers. The city of Vaughan is currently home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We acknowledge their contributions to the life and prosperity of this land. As representatives of the people of the city of Vaughan, we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and live in this territory. So I'd like to once again express our sincere gratitude to the Vice Chair of the Vaughan Public Library Board, Gary Thompson, who had a vision of a lecture series that educated us on important issues and challenged worldviews and existing perceptions. I also want to thank the staff and the speakers who've brought this series to life over the past few months. These are topics that shape our society on a daily basis, and it's our role as a library to explore them and encourage further discussion. Throughout the lecture series, we've discovered sources of inspiration, enlightenment, and hope. Our speakers have shone a light on difficult topics, and we've confronted hard truths through which we can all learn and create a better, fairer society. Today's session will be no different. We're honored to have Dr. Lauren Foster as our speaker here this evening. Dr. Foster is a professor at the York University School of Public Policy and Administration and the York Research Chair in Black Canadian Studies and Human Rights. He's also the director of the Institute for Social Research, one of Canada's leading university-based survey research centers. Dr. Foster is the author of Racial Profiling and Human Rights in Canada, The New Legal Landscape. And I'll share that Vaughan Public Libraries has copies of this book available in the collection and you are welcome to borrow them. Tonight, Dr. Foster will use his considerable knowledge to provide insights into how organizations can meet their responsibilities to root out anti-Black racism. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Foster. Thank you, Margie, uh, and thank you, Alicia and, and Gary. And uh, I also want to thank uh, all the staff here at the uh, Vaughan Public Library. And good evening to everybody out there in Zoom land. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk about a very wicked problem in Canada, and that is systemic anti-Black racism. I hope to provide some insights into why and how organizations where we live and where we work should make efforts to understand and root out systemic anti-Black racism. There's been a long standing invisibility of harms that Black people have been subject to in this country, a country that hangs much of its reputation on the hook of multiculturalism as a way of life and ideology based on the value of racial tolerance and harmony of differences. But historically, the black experience has been at odds with this ideology and it is often erased by a false na national narrative that rests on a perceived commitment to mixed society. <clears throat> 
It's remarkable, and I think it's even perfidiously magical how the experiences of Black people living in Canada continue to be disappeared. They continue to be erased. They're erased from mainstream media often. They're disappeared from the education system. They're disappeared from most people's conceptions of this country's history and this country's presence and standing in the world. My personal experience and personal start in thinking about this erasure was 30 years ago. I was coming back from a flight from uh, South America and I had a transit stop in Miami at Miami International Airport. And when I said I was born and raised in Canada, immigration in Miami detained me for five hours. They were sure that there was some kind of scam going on. Canadiana just did not conjure up images of black folks for those people at that time. And we're still being disappeared, I believe, from most people's perceptions and conceptions of this country's history. In the context of historical erasure, it's been a heady and, and a hopeful time recently in the last few years, as we've witnessed sweeping global protests against racial inequality and injustice that have shifted public opinion here at home and internationally in support of systemic change. And there have been increasing calls around the world for a kind of a racial reckoning, a racial reckoning internationally. And this has been a clarion call. Now, systemic anti-Black racism is finally on society's agenda. However, even with the calls for racial reckoning, we're still left with the problem of converting protest into policy, converting racial justice protest into policy. Now, where I live, policy is the link between aspirations and change. So the question is, how do we turn progressive public opinion and the goodwill that we're experiencing now in this world and in this society into a new social reality? For a critical public policy scientist like myself, uh, we call this problem embedding justice. How do we lock it in? How do we lock in this new goodness that's happening and, and, and occurring around the world? How do we transform the justice and equity aspirations into human rights obligations? And that's what I wanna talk about here tonight. The short answer is though, focusing on increasing policy capacity can bring about effective equity and human rights solutions. This begins with the understanding that everything wrong with society is a policy failure. Racism is ultimately a policy failure. And for some of us, the ultimate policy failure is racism in this society. So when we look at the torment of anti-Black racism, the goal of policy science is to increase policy capacity. That is to create policy initiatives and continue to create policy initiatives, create special programs and continue to create special programs, interventions, uh, preventative strategies, uh, invent participatory resources, as many as we can, resources that can support black people and other vulnerable groups in the society to become represented in all, in all corners of it. All of this is used to dismantle harms, close gaps, redress disadvantage for people of color. And it is that simple and it is that difficult. And this is how we can take specific, measurable and accountable steps towards what I call a real multiculturalism. That is a multiculturalism that is finally based on a level playing field and actual fair competition for all.
I'm trying to move on here, sorry. Stuck. Ooh, there it is. Yes, tonight there's, I'm here to talk about uh, three interrelated matters to help understand and dismantle systemic anti-Black racism. First, uh, I want to provide a lens into systemic anti-Black uh, uh, racism as a wicked problem marked by layers of complexity. I use that word wicked problem advisedly. Uh, researchers have suggested that there's a difference between wicked problems and tame problems. Tame problems really are formulaic. They're linear. There are problems that are amenable to straightforward recipes. So it's like baking a cake. If you know how to bake one cake, if you've got the ingredients for one cake and you want 30 cakes, then you multiply those ingredients 30 times. Uh, researchers have also suggested that this is a kind of problem that science is good at. Science is really, social science is really good at tame problems, but wicked problems, not so much. Because wicked problems have no uh, sort of determinable starting point or stopping point. They're impurgated layers of complexity. That means layer upon layer of complexity. And that's the way anti-Black racism functions in the society. It's multi-sectoral, it's multi-dimensional, and it's entrenched in uh, institutional norms, attitudes, practices, and the culture itself. And I want to kind of expose that a little bit, and then I'll move on to my second theme or second uh, area of discussion, which is uh, uh, the systemic focused policy tools or levers that can be used to address embedded inequities in our society or to attempt to embed equity in the society as well. And the, the kind of tools I'm going to discuss tonight are, are primarily about affirmative recruitment and affirmative retention in the workplace. And these are examples of the process of how to embed equity into a modern workplaces in our society. And finally, I'm going to discuss the wider processes of leveraging policy, that is, how to recalibrate and reset society's agenda and design the future. I want to briefly engage the importance of thinking in terms of systems and processes rather than in terms of recipes when we're addressing wicked social problems like anti-Black racism. Uh, so let me begin to explore a lens into systemic anti-Black racism by looking at some real-time examples related to our current uh, global pandemic. In the last two years or so, there's been a confluence of COVID and race, but the COVID-19 pandemic did not make a just Canada unjust, rather it aggravated the conditions of injustice, which were already pervasive in Canada. The pandemic unveils the violence of the normal. That is, it unveiled the violence that is otherwise a normal condition of the everyday life of black people and people of color in this country. COVID has amplified existing disparities. And these disparities are acutely felt by already marginalized and racialized communities. So people are now slowly becoming cognizant of longstanding social cleavages that have been concealed and largely neglected until now, related to geography, related to health, related to criminal justice, and other uh, uh, access to justice issues and particularly related to the political economy, the economy of our society, as well as other sectors. Let me point out 
a few of the more glaring examples. First, the pandemic has exposed, exposed some deeply ingrained social spatial inequities in our society. That is, it's exposed the geography of anti-Black racism. We normally don't think of the geography of, uh, of anti-Black racism until some catastrophes like critique Katrina come up or come along, and then you see dead bloated bodies floating in Lake Pontchartrain, or until our recent global pandemic and the damage and destruction it has done all over the world, including in Canada. It's George Lipson who actually clues us in to the geography of anti-Black racism. George Lipson formulated and exposed the dialectic of race and space. What is that? Well, in our context here in Canada and in Toronto, we, could, we have seen and witnessed the housing and inner city neighborhood vulnerabilities that are intensely magnified during a pandemic. Black people tend to live in poorer and more po polluted neighborhoods, uh, more densely populated areas. They have more people per household. And when we look closely, we see that this built environment has played a role in establishing and maintaining systemic reasons for pandemic related outcomes. George Lipset noted and called this uh, the lived experience of race. And he suggested that the lived experience of race has spatial dimensions and the lived experience of space has racial dimensions. That's all we need to know about the dialectic of race and space. It's fair to say that until now, and until George Lipset, I, I believe, we have been slow to realize what Lipset knew all along, and that is there are fatal links that connect race, place, and power, which COVID has underscored in our society. And there are related health inequities tied to anti-Black racism during COVID as well. Recent studies have found that compared to the Canadian average, Black Canadians report far worse health outcomes related to COVID-19. They're more likely to report symptoms. They're more likely to seek treatment. And in Canada, there are nearly three times they're near, uh, as likely to report knowing someone who is died of the virus. For example, recently last year, uh, CBC reported that uh, black and racialized people make up 83% of the reported uh, COVID-19 cases in Toronto. So COVID-19 lays bare the ways that discrimination drives health inequities among black people and other people of color. Of course, we see more clearly the criminal justice inequities uh, of anti-Black racism in our society, in our continent. And this is most dramatized by the public arena through police civilian relations. That is through the deadly force and arbitrary force incidents that uh, have been exposed recently in the last few years and the high profile killings and civil unrest in both Canada and the United States. In the United States, the most recent incidents we've heard about are the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Jason Blake. And Canada has also shared deadly incidents. Regis Korczynski Piquet, DeAndre Campbell, Nicholas Gibbs, Orlando Brown. In Canada, we can, we can really go all the way back to the 70s. And Albert Johnson and Lester Donaldson, must we forget. But they're being exposed and, and uncovered today in ways that they were not before. COVID-19 has impacted the criminal justice system in other access to justice uh, areas and issues. Uh, in different and more subtle ways as well. 
uh, it's generally accelerated a trend uh, uh, to what, towards what people are calling or what scholars are calling minimalist justice. This is a more subtle damage than the uh, 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 deadly force incidents in the criminal justice system, but equally as damaging. This minimal justice has been particularly devastating in the human rights system, uh, which I uh, 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 am familiar with and have worked in for a, a number of years. And it's devastating in that it's downloaded rights and responsibilities on the victims, most of whom are racialized and or marginalized. Minimal justice is marked by diminished funding and diminished expectations. Both are connected to increased delays in resolving people's legal problems, not only in the human rights system, but in other areas of, of criminal justice as well. So during COVID, the courthouses have reduced capacity and justice support agencies like the Legal Support Center, for instance, are being silenced as non-essential. It's bringing into question just outcomes in family law, in civil disputes, as well as in criminal law. And even, as I alluded to, our constitutionally grounded human rights legislative framework. This is the framework of my intellectual and racialized ancestors who had fought and suffered for the very foundation of the inclusive multicultural uh, uh, society that we all aspire towards. This is all very disconcerting. Both the damage of excessive and deadly uh, force used by police and the subtle devastation of minimal justice trends now taking hold in the criminal justice system are equally damaging. Finally, there's been important revelations about the political economy, that is the economics of anti-Black racism during COVID as well. It's important to note that political economy is connected to gainful employment, which is fundamental to achieving equality in our society. It's fundamental for all communities to be able to, to, to access gainful employment, to obtain gainful employment, if we're going to have an egalitarian or an equitable society. All of the structural inequities I've talked about so far are all overlapped by the political economy. This means gainful employment and the workplace is the integral policy space for dismantling deeply ingrained structures of power and privilege. I want you to remember this, uh, 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 the workplace is a good place to begin the racial reckoning. Uh, I want you to remember this because I will get back to this, but first, I want to introduce or talk about a national wide study by the African Canadian Civic Engagement Council, the ACCEC. And they found that Black Canadians are more likely to report layoffs or reduced work hours in their households. 56% in Black households, of Black households, and 43% of other households. And Blacks we're more likely to worry about having to pay rent in the, in the coming months as well. That is 45% in black household, of black households and 36% of other households. They're also more likely than Canadian, the Canadian average to say their household finances have been negatively, negatively impacted by COVID. This report suggested that Poor health outcomes for Black Canadians may be explained by greater exposure at work to the virus. Black and brown workers are overrepresented on the front lines as essential workers in low status and low wage service occupations. So Black Canadians are much more likely to report job uh, 
their job requires them to work with people face to face, they are more likely uh, to feel that no matter what steps they take, their day-to-day -day routines put them at an uncomfortable high risk of catching the virus. For example, Black Canadians are twice as likely to take public transport and twice as likely to report that their commute is unsafe. Now, all of these structural vulnerabilities related to geography, related to health, related to the criminal justice system, related to the human rights system, uh, uh, the economy, they're all magnified by the pandemic. And they attest to the subtle, multi-sectoral layers of complexity that drive systemic anti-Black racism and disadvantage in our society. Sociology is helpful in understanding uh, anti-Black racism here as well. David Wilborn has argued, the majority of modern racism remains hidden beneath a veneer of normality. And it is only the more crude and obvious forms of racism that are, are, are seen as problematic by most people. In this way, being a racist is reduced to a very simple formula. A racist is seen as a, an individual, not a system, who consciously dislikes others based on race and intentionally seeks to be mean or malicious or hateful towards them. Consequently, the dominant discourse on racism in our society presents it as mean people doing mean things to other people. This is very simplistic uh, uh, formula. And it's reinforced by the fact that in Canada, we have a number of legal acts that uh, protect against discrimination. Uh, and many people think that because we have a strong legal infrastructure and strong infrastructure of laws, such as the Multiculturalism Act, Employment Equity Act, and even the Human Rights Act to some extent, that discrimination is gone. Now, while old fashioned, blatant, overt discrimination is on the wane in modern society, as most uh, research indicates, implicit or unconscious bias is a persistent issue. For instance, implicit associations about Black people lead to bias stereotypes. The idea that young Black males are treated as perceived threats and symptoms of danger and criminality exists everywhere throughout the society. Some of you might remember the incident in New York Central Park where a black man was bird watching and a white woman, uh, uh, he asked to put her dog on a leash. And she called the police claiming that he was threatening her life. Or you might remember the incident in Barhaven Park in Ottawa where a white woman called 911 on a young black man who was riding his bike and stopped on a bridge. And she thought that he didn't leave her enough room to, to uh, maneuver around him. And when the police arrived in that incident, as a matter of fact, in Ottawa, they told, immediately told the young black male to stop. This is, I, I think, small indications of what I had just mentioned in terms of how biased stereotypes of black males really perceive them as threats and symptoms of danger and criminality. Implicit biases lead to base, uh, biased racial stereotypes, which also lead to discriminatory behavior. Now, the classic example of this, or at least the classic example for me, is a story I heard about Michael Jordan, who, who many of you will know as the billionaire basketball uh, player and franchise owner. And as the story goes, told by another basketball player, Charles Barkley, Michael Jordan entered an elevator and had a, 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 that was occupied by a elderly black, oh, excuse me, white lady 
and the white lady immediately tucked her purse close to her chest, to her side. And as Charles Barkley tells it, after about a gazillion microaggressions against Michael Jordan from the time he was a child until the time he was uh, uh, retired from basketball, he finally stopped and, and turned to the elderly lady and said, ma'am, I would be more worried about you robbing me than me robbing you. The, the, the interesting part about that story for me that's unsaid is that the elderly lady looked bemused. She had no idea what Michael Jordan was talking about. And she had no idea, I believe, because all implicit racial biases are automatic, they're ambivalent, and they're ambiguous. But they are much more dangerous, or at least as dangerous, as old-fashioned prejudices and discrimination. That, that is because they go undetected. But they have equally destructive impact on people's lives. So the argument, the sociological argument here is to understand anti-Black racism, it requires taking the big picture of how society operates. Rather than just looking at interactions between individuals or individual feelings and failings, this goes beyond the idea that racism is about deluded or immoral people. In the big picture, racism is leveraged by culture, power, and institutions. In this sense, we can say systemic anti-Black racism is the devaluation of Blacks in Canada at a covert systems level. Now, I was one, I wanna talk about uh, an example of this, of, of, of how systemic anti-Black racism is leveraged by power, culture, and institutions. Uh, in relation to a study that I conducted uh, in Ottawa. I was one of three researchers from York University to conduct the largest race data traffic stop study in Canadian policing history. And that was for the Ottawa Police Service. We did actually did two studies, one from 2013 to 15, one from 2016 to 19. But the 2000 13 to 15 study was the uh, uh, groundbreaking study it, simply because it was innovative. It was dynamic, it was full body, it was muscular, it was vigorous, and I can pat myself on the back. <laughs> uh, uh, I do believe it's, it's fair to say it was all of those things because it introduced a couple new factors. The study collected this robust demographic information, such as race and sex and age. But it went beyond that to collect the reasons for stops and outcomes for stops. And not only that, it collected over 120,000 traffic stops over the first uh, two year period. And the main findings of that study uh, were first that Middle Eastern and black drivers were the two groups stopped disproportionately to their numbers in the population. Uh, Middle Eastern drivers on the whole were stopped 3.3 times more than you would expect based on their population. Black drivers on the whole were stopped 2.3 times more than what you'd expect given their population. And, and Middle Eastern dr male drivers 16 to 24 were stopped 12 times more than what you'd expect based on their population. Black males 16 to 24 were stopped eight times more than what you'd expect based on their population. And these are exceptionally disproportionate numbers, particularly when we're talking about young East Middle Eastern males and young black males. Let me give you an example of this. Compared to the United States, this is multiple times more disproportionality than 
the standard uh, for uh, 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 studies in, of racial profiling there. And they have a long history of, uh, of studying racial profiling and therefore more established in terms of their uh, uh, levels of what would be a significant disproportionality. And for the most part, as an industry standard in the United States, a ratio of 1.5 to two would be significant disproportionality. Anything exceeding that would be subject to judicial or administrative action. What we're talking about in Canada with this study is multiple times what they think is a significant disproportionality in the United States, multiple times. And this goes unnoticed in, in the Canadian scene. The kind of uh, 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 police, black uh, citizen relations that exist here can are equal or perhaps in certain regions more devastating and damaging than they are in the United States. Now here I've got a, uh, a, a, a graphic of, of this, to, to, mainly to uh, highlight uh, the differences and, and, and show you the significance of those differences. Uh, if you look at the last row in this graphic, you can see that the only pattern of significant disproportionality is really related to Middle Eastern drivers and black drivers. Uh, all of those other groups, uh, with the exception of, of other racialized minorities, are below the line. That means that police during this period didn't stop them. There was not even a one-to-one -one ratio. They were stopped less than their uh, numbers in the population in terms of ratio. Uh, this shows, this also shows, I guess, that the, the import of disaggregated race data in understanding uh, 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 systemic anti-racism, anti-black racism and systemic racism in general and understanding the relationship between race, culture and power. Uh, it's, it shows the structural patterns of conduct that can often go unnoticed if we're looking at individuals. And these patterns of conduct go beyond individual feelings and failings. They go beyond the feelings and failings of a racist cop. So the idea and the theory that many of you have probably heard about bad appleism, how uh, police services and other organizations uh, are good, however they do have a few bad apples, is not really held or, or substantiated by this graphic. What we see here is that systemic anti-Black racism or, or systemic racism in relation to, to, to the uh, Middle Eastern community refers to barriers that are inherent in the normal functioning of the institution. And they affect Middle Eastern and black people in disproportionately negative ways, causing adverse or potentially adverse impacts and consequences. So again, modern organizations are primarily discriminatory at a covert level that often goes undetected or provides plausible deniability for organizational management on occasion as well. It is embedded in attitudes, patterns of behavior and practices that are part of the organizational structure, perpetuating disadvantage for people. That is, it is embedded in the informal, unwritten rules of the game. Now, from a human rights approach, if we wanted to expose those unwritten rules, there are three decisive considerations or what I call triangulation points or in what the Human Rights Commission calls triangulation points as well for rooting out anti-Black racism and 
other isms. The first is numerical data. You have to have the numerical data. You have to, to, to be able to drill down into the patterns of behavior of an organization. And in the case of the uh, traffic stop study that I talked to you about, you could drill down into subcategories in between categories as we did 16 to 24, uh, uh, males, females, et cetera. And they're able to inform you regarding disparities and disproportionalities. And you can acquire a fine grained comprehension of an organization that you could not do otherwise. So the demographic scan allows you to overcome hidden biases. It, it exposes gaps. It provides you with an evidence-based understanding and frame of reference from which to begin to uh, 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 repair and redress discrimination. In the case of Ottawa, that is exactly what happened, the case. I mean, you're dealing with people of goodwill. When you provide them with evidence, they are able to act on it. I'm talking about the, the Ottawa Police Service now. And it becomes a common frame of reference from which you can engage the community and actually redress uh, 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 the gaps, the biases uh, 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 and vulnerabilities that exist. The second triangulation point is organizational culture. You're able to examine, when you examine organizational culture, you're examining the attitudes, the norms, and the shared perspectives of that organization. And it allows you to expose the unattended, unintended consequences. I mean, the classic example of this is, is the, uh, uh, and there's been human rights cases that have, uh, uh, been similar to this, and that is the, the, the organization that wants their employees to be clean shaven. Oftentimes, that uh, 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 good intention can violate the rights uh, or religious rights of individuals, as we know, uh, who have to maintain their beards and, and, and uh, uh, for religious purposes, etc. That is one classic example, there are many examples of how attempting to uh, examine you and be vigilant about your attitudes, norms, and shared beliefs can reveal unintended consequences. And I'll talk about that a little more later. The third triangulation point is policies, practices, decision-making processes, which need to be examined. And these refer to such things as hiring, recruitment, retention, and promotion. They, they are the primary focus of my talk today, or at least the, the rest of my talk today. Uh, on this last point, I want to turn to uh, affirmative action and uh, affirmative re re retention or affirmative recruitment and, re and retention. I want to pivot now to, to the political economy, as I suggested uh, before, and uh, uh, recognize that it is the accent, ac uh, access point of a market based society such as ours. And it would be the place, since given the time constraints that we have for me to try to complete this conversation. The, there are a couple, affirmative re recruitment and affirmative retention are a couple of structure focused policy interventions and advances against workplace discrimination. In a human rights approach, the goal of affirmative recruitment fundamentally is to hire the most appropriate, appropriately qualified person for the position through a process that considers EDI, equity, diversity, and inclusion implications. The equity, diversity, 
and inclusion commitment is very important for a human rights approach. This is both proactive and remedial and is based on democratic inflection points like a level playing field and like fair competition. Let me give you an example of this to flesh this out a little more. Years ago, it's gotta be over 30 years ago now, I was uh, shortlisted for a tenured position to become a race professor at a institution that will remain nameless. And I went to this interview as, uh, and uh, was interviewed by 16 white people. That is the whole department came out and that time the department was white. I was very upset, I was unnerved. I, I didn't know what to, how to contain myself given that situation and how important it was to me. Later I realized how important it was to them as well because uh, 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 many of you know, and some of you may not, that tenure is a very coveted uh, a circumstance in a university. To become tenure really means that uh, you practically have a job for life. And you can see that if I was going to be tenured, these individuals would have an investment in that because they would have to work with me for the rest of their life. So in some respects, it was incumbent upon them uh, 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 to make sure that I would be an individual that they could work with for the rest of their life. However, on the other end of that, the intimidation of a young black man having to be interviewed by 16 white people uh, wasn't lost on me. And as I said, I was quite upset, quite unnerved <laughs> and, and uh, 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 began to answer questions. Well, at one particular point in the interview, uh, near the end, actually, they brought up, uh, which was perfunctory for a race professor, asked me the difference and examples for eth ethnocentrism and racism. What's the difference between ethnocentrism and racism, Dr. Foster? I said at that particular time, not being over my being upset, I said, ethnocentrism is the belief that your group is superior and the belief that uh, what's true for your group is true for others as well. And of course, that's not controversial because that's what ethnocentrism is, that there's only one definition of ethnocentrism. It's the only universal phenomenon. We all believe that our group is worthwhile, otherwise we wouldn't belong to the group. And they said, yes, they nodded, they understood that. And uh, they said, well, give us an example, Dr. Foster. And I said, well, an example of ethnocentrism is 16 white people interviewing a black guy for a job for which he's overqualified. And I did expect half a smile, but I didn't get one. I mean, I got a smirk out of, out of, out of a couple of people, but that was it. And then they said, well, well, give me a definition of racism. And I said, Racism is the differential and disproportionate treatment of an individual on the basis of skin color or some other physical characteristic over which he has no control. Uh, at that time, that was a little more controversial because racism at that time is different than the conversation today because it was considered to be an ideology. It was considered to be an ideology of superiority, not an action. And I put it in action context, which they accepted, the differential and disproportionate treatment of an individual. And I explained it and they accepted it. So, okay, well, give us an example. And I said, an example of racism is that black guy not getting the job. <laughs> and at that particular point, I got no smirks and no laughs or no uh, 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 comment at all. Uh, as I saw with, were people who were insulted and people who were disgusted with, uh, with my conversation or, or at least my perspective on that. So they were put off, I was put off, they considered me to have a lack of gratitude, I considered them to have a lack of, 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 of uh, 
uh, I suppose, respect for my difference. But since then, you know, and I wondered about that for a long time, struggled with that uh, in my own mind, but I don't think that there's much of a struggle today, not with what we know, not with what race research has uncovered and continues to uncover. Today, since then, since that particular point, race research has unmasked the phenomena of homophily, for instance. Homophily is the tendency for people to hire people like themselves. Study after study has shown us that that is exactly what happens normally in the workplace. People hire people like themselves. And there's also uncovered cultural cloning cultural cloning and social reproduction, which and both, both of these really refer to the tendency for people in power positions to reproduce themselves in those power positions. And with all of these discoveries in a multicultural society, what we find as the consequence is that it all leads to the diversification of whiteness, where we find today there's diversity, but the diversity really only extends mainly to the inclusion of white women. Now this social psychological phenomena, these social psychological phenomena are untended and they've become unintended discriminatory consequences in our society. The patterns of homophilia, cultural cloning and social reproduction which lead to the diversification of whiteness, demonstrate how racism can be systematic. It's an invisible and tasteless social poison, and it is difficult to eliminate. And moreover, it indicates uh, employers should take proactive, uh, a proactive approach to ensuring their hiring practices are inclusive or at least adhere to the Human Rights Code by testing and challenging their processes to uncover hidden prejudices and implicit bias. And affirmative recruitment is one way to contest racism. And the mechanism really starts with hiring a hiring strategy. You begin with auditing the EDI equity diversity implications of all your talent decisions, including applying for a job, recruiting, training, transfers, promotions, uh, in terms of apprenticeships, dismissals, layoffs, terminations, what else? Everything. And even rates of pay, pay cuts, codes of conduct, overtime, performance evaluations, discipline, everything. All of the work process points need to be continuously tested and challenged to uncover hidden prejudices and bias. And beyond hiring strategies, you also, organizations should also develop and implement uh, equal opportunity employment policies. And these policies should cast a wide net. The targets, they should target sources where diversity, or excuse me, diverse candidates congregate. They can use passive candidates or search out passive candidates by being proactive and, and, and pursuing them themselves. They can use social media. They can use people finding strategies. And one good strategy that organizations who, who are thoughtful use is attempting to uh, uh, source out, use their existing sources of racialized and black employees to assist them in that. Now, next organization should consider diversity, uh, cultural competence, and anti-racism training for hiring committees. Now, this is not always effective depending upon the quality of the training. And indeed, some studies suggest, many studies suggest that this training is, is, is very uneven. Actually, there are uh, 
most studies today would suggest that diversity training is absolutely useless. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cultural competency training is probably the most effective, uh, even more so than anti-racism training. But diversity training, uh, just to give you an example, there have been studies that, that have shown that companies that have used diversity training 10 years ago, after their longitudinal study of 10 years, that they're worse, they have worse employee relations than they had 10 years prior when they introduced the diversity training. So to me, that suggests that uh, we have to actually uh, evolve and, and uh, transform uh, our training processes away from uh, what's now being uh, 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 developed or being used as diversity training. Next, uh, organizations should also consider forming affinity groups, uh, that is empowering small groups to uh, uh, that racialize of racialized employees because it allows them to brainstorm new ideas and support each other and they can uh, uh, and that camaraderie can be very helpful. Uh, a good example of that, I believe, is the, in the OPS, the Ontario Police, uh, excuse me, the, uh, the, the Ontario Public Service, not the uh, Ottawa Police Service, Ontario Public Service. There's the Bopsers, that's a good example. I believe the Black uh, OPSers, on Black Ontario Public Servants, uh, they actually do all of that. They actually provide a lot of support and camaraderie for uh, uh, Black uh, employees in the public service. There's also uh, FACO, the Federation of Asian Canadian Lawyers, which is a, a good example. And CABLE, the uh, Canadian Association of Black Lawyers, they support uh, uh, and uh, brainstorm new ideas very well in those organizations. Finally, in terms of affirmative recruitment, uh, this is not the end of the conversation, but I think it's a very a major uh, 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 positive, and that is uh, a human rights, human resources departments should create exit interview assessments. Now this goes to issues of accountability and transparency and getting feedback on uh, engagement of employees. You know, that's, can you, you can see with exit uh, interviews, what employees didn't like and did like or, 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 and what's positive and what's negative about your organization. Oftentimes, it's occupational mobility. Is the organization closed or is it open? Do racialized employees have the opportunity to move ahead and move up or is there, are there ceilings and, and invisible barriers for them in those organizations? Affirmative retention starts with professional development and job training for honing and sharpening skills. Uh, career advancement training that enables new skills so you, people can move up in an organization. Acting appointments are very important and, and very proactive in organizations and acquiring uh, role proficiency. Some police services I've worked with are beginning to use this very effectively, I believe. And there are other organizations as well, but I work with several police services, so I see this firsthand and up close, how racialized officers are able to uh, uh, get acting appointments, become proficient in those roles, and it allows them to move up in the organization. Feature assignments is an is, is a important uh, function that, uh, that helps uh, individuals, uh, racialized individuals with uh, responsibility and initiative and, teach, and allows them to have some degree of independence, which is oftentimes valuable in, uh, in, in a workplace, in a work life. High profile special projects. This kind of allows people, special projects kind of gives you confidence. It uh, gives you a sense of accomplishment. Those are very important uh, uh, 
uh, initiatives in an organization in terms of affirmative re uh, re retention, aiming for a culturally competent work environment. A primary tenet of cultural competency is being aware of your own worldview. Now, a, a good place to begin to develop multicultural perspective is by becoming more aware of your own cultural learning assumptions and learned assumptions, some of which may be culturally biased. So this goes beyond diversity by the numbers of an, in an organization, having the bodies in an organization. And it acquires, uh, aspires for a more dynamic three-dimensional diversity of perspectives in an organization, cultural competency. And next, uh, researchers have found that organizational readiness is an important factor in having a representative workforce, an equitable workforce. Now, in terms of say the academic context, which I'm most familiar with, this would mean if universities like York are interested in making uh, equity hires like the Black Professors Initiative that York actually has, in deciding the units, uh, uh, which units should receive the positions, a criteria of readiness should be applied. For instance, in some universities in the United States, units making equity hires are also required to show what steps they're taking to ensure that the, those hires are being made in an environment that is welcoming and is able to provide supports that mitigate the kinds of challenges that, that Blacks and other racialized uh, academics face. And finally, the last well, item or uh, point I'd like to talk about in terms of retention is mentoring. Mentoring is the alchemy of affirmative retention. Most, uh, 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 it's the most important retention mechanism that is identified in literature. Uh, and for the professional development and success of racialized employees, mentoring is the key. There have been studies in the United States, for instance, uh, and all of them, every single one of them, I've, I've actually taken uh, great pains to uh, uh, research this. Every single one of those studies on racialized senior executives in the United States, all of those senior executives say and reveal that they would have never gotten to where they were if they didn't have a strong mentor. And the strong mentor who nurtures uh, uh, their growth and their talents. They all say they would never be where they are without the mentor. Now, one theory of this, this alchemy, as I call it, uh, is really connected to the sociologist Martin Berber's theory of dialogic communication. So and I'm, I'm actually uh, formulating this uh, as I speak. It's, it's, it's nothing that uh, uh, has... Uh, been uh, 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 commonly uh, explored in the area of mentoring. But I do believe that Berber gives us a clue in terms of his ideas of dialogic communication. Uh, mentoring really would be, in his estimation, I think, a true dialogic uh, uh, situation where we can see the mentee gets to witness what's proven success what, and what proven success looks like uh, uh, is from an influential senior supporter and uh, sponsor. And at the same time, the mentor is sort of sensitized as a senior corporate manager to the challenges and disadvantages of underrepresented marginalized groups. So those sort of connections are actually very dynamic in the mentoring situation, I believe. But a complete human rights approach beyond affirmative uh, uh, recruitment and retention really uh, uh, 
revolves around five effective parts. Uh, five effective parts. And the first part is not only a plan for preventing and reviewing and removing barriers, but you also, you also have to have a anti-discrimination and anti-harassment policy. And you also have to have an internal complaints procedure in your organization. And you also have to have accommodations policies and procedures. So these rights protections for vulnerable categories are very important for an equitable environment in, in the workplace. The vulnerable categories being you know, race, religion, gender, disability, et cetera. And the intersectional vulnerabilities that uh, are, are uh, existent in those organizations as well. And finally, and the human rights uh, approach tells you this, an education and training program at all levels of the organization would be important for nurturing an equitable workplace as well. And this would include an ensuring, uh, ensuring that all managers receive anti-racism and cultural competency training, uh, and also making foundational anti-racism training available to all employees at another level, and customizing anti-racism and cultural competency training for human uh, uh, resources professionals as well. So all three levels of an organization need to be trained, not simply the employees. Uh, now, this is a thoroughgoing and to, uh, human rights approach that uses policy to drive equity by baking it into the system. All in all, I want to suggest to you that uh, all the organizations that are interested in equity, diversity, and inclusion should, should always be thinking about uh, a human rights context. Equity, diversity, and inclusion should be understood in a human rights context. Human rights is the legal framework that we have in our society for the protection of vulnerable differences and significant differences in our society. And it aligns, that is the human rights context, aligns EDI to the values of respect, dignity, fairness, freedom, and mutual independence. They're all linked to and legally sanctioned by the human rights context. And it is this context that EDI aspirations are transformed into human rights obligations, ensconced in our human rights constitutional foundations. Now in closing, I just wanna leave you with my uh, uh, action plan for contesting the wicked problem of anti, anti uh, 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 black racism. Now, we need to first realize that systemic problems require systemic solutions. And second, we need to realize that fixes that do not address the root causes of systemic problems are not fixes of all. So the good news is though, as we've tried to suggest tonight, we can all learn to pay better attention to the root causes of racism by learning to leverage system level approaches to equity, diversity, and inclusion grounded in a human rights framework. A human rights approach is not guided by challenging uh, 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 or solving social problems as much as creating a process for designing the future of our institutions. In a human rights context, this is called inclusive design. That is leveraging policy is the key to recalibrating 
and inclusive society, leveraging policy to make organizations more equitable and inclusive with inflection points on level playing fields and fair competition. I think if we all think in terms of inclusive design in regard to every aspect of organiz an organizational system, that is when we are developing programs and, and when we're developing employment processes or, or physical accessibility for our plants uh, 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 and including differences in perspective as well. That is breaking down physical and non-physical barriers. We are designing a better future. So I've come to the end and I hope that my talk offers some food for thought about uh, human rights instruments as participatory resources that uh, can afford opportunities to support and promote workplace equity and begin to dismantle the deeply ingrained structures of power and privilege that allow anti-Black racism to thrive in our society. And with that, I'm going to sign off. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Foster, for your excellent presentation and for sharing your extensive knowledge and insights with us this evening. I, for one, totally enjoyed it. Before we move on to the questions and answers, I would like to ask Gary Thompson, Vice Chair of Vaughan Public Library Board, to say a few words. Gary? Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Gary Thompson, and I'm the Vice Chair of the Vaughan Public Library Board. On behalf of everyone present in the audience and Vaughan Public Libraries, I'd like to thank Dr. Foster for this great discourse, for this amazing presentation. Our series to date has explored many facets of the Black experience in our city of Vaughan, in Ontario, in Canada, and how it has been shaped by history, perception, and lived experience. Understanding is a very important first step, but it is also the duty of all people and organizations to take concrete action to eliminate the anti-Black discrimination and racism that currently may be tolerated or may be ignored or maybe be accepted as status quo the right to work without fear of discrimination or hate is fundamentally rooted in fairness. And I believe that you, Dr. Foster, has provided us with powerful thoughts, insightful thoughts, and powerful tools to enable that. On behalf of the board, the staff, of Vaughan Public Library Boards and the citizens of Vaughan. Thank you everyone for attending. And we hope to see you again at our next session. Thank you so very much, Gary. We would now like to open the floor to questions. If you have a question for Dr. Foster, please submit it in the chat function and we will select a few of those questions and pass it on to him. So, uh, so, so here is a, Sorry, here is a comment question. At the heart of this is challenging power. If the organization's leaders are not committed, whose responsibility is it to do? Uh, well, that is, that is very difficult because in the organization, I believe that leadership has to be committed. Uh, if leadership is not committed, it's, it is an uphill battle that you're unlikely to resolve for quite a substantial period of time. You know, uh, I don't know. There are analogies. <clears throat> there are analogies there that relate to uh, black civil rights and human rights movements uh, that uh, society actually resists. 
uh, and and what happens there when people in the society, like pe people in organizations, like people in society, are not committed to progressive change, inequality, and 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 representation. You move one step forward, and then you're always pushed two steps back. There's revanchment in a situation where the leadership, whether it's tacit or whether it's explicit, is resistant to any kind of progressive change. So it's very difficult to make any kind of uh, equitable or, or, or democratic uh, uh, movement in an organization or a society when the leadership is not committed to it. Uh, basically, you're left there with incremental moves. You're left there with grassroots uh, 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 projects that you have to deal with. I want to give another analogy to that. You know, I was in class years and years and years ago, and I wanted to talk about poverty. And I hope this analogy works. Uh, and there are two students who put up their hand. And one student said, you know, we can end poverty in society if we give everybody a million dollars. You know, and you, you kind of look and that's true, but how are you gonna give everybody a million dollars? And the next student said, well, maybe we could start with, you know, improving our food banks. One of the things I've noticed, she said, is that they don't have multicultural food products on the shelves anymore, et cetera, et cetera. Now that's a practical move. It's an incremental move. And it's a move that you can make in a society that is slow to, to, to believe and to adopt a transformative uh, approach to equality. So you're, without leadership, you're left to making small moves. They move forward, but that is where you're going to have to exist. You're gonna to have to exist in your activism. You're gonna to have to exist in creating policy initiatives that uh, 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 are real time and improve our life situations. And you continue to try to convince uh, individuals to become the leaders that are going to be dynamic and, uh, 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 and make larger moves in the end. Okay, thank you. So here's a comment and, and another question. So the, the commenter said, this was an excellent presentation, thank you. And the question is, what would you want young African descended people to know about navigating the labor market? Hmm, that is a very good question. Um, again, <clears throat> Uh, again, I'm going to turn to policy, and, and this is what needs to happen. This is what people should be advocating happening in our society. Um, what we need to do is focus on active labor market policies. You think about youth, that we should have a youth focus, and we should be considering things like welfare to work programs, job creation programs, apprenticeship training schemes, even employment subsidies. These are the things that are gonna deal with the intergenerational trauma of black youth. These are things that are gonna allow black youth to make uh, inroads and to, to, to take a step into and forward in the marketplace, in, in, the, in workplaces. So, you know, adequately funded intervention and prevention policies are also important for uh, African, or excuse me, African Canadian youth too as well. And those are things that we need to, 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 to focus on to help black youth. Of course they can help themselves, but we need to help black youth as well. We gotta consider community housing. Uh, you know, I mean, many of the black youth and marginalized youth are living in, 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 in poverty and we can, we can convince governments to reallocate resources for housing. 
You know, if somebody doesn't have a place to live or if somebody's hungry and doesn't have enough money for food, it's hard for them to focus on, you know, their schoolwork. And it, then it's hard for them to get good jobs, you know what I mean, in the end. Uh, we can have criminal justice diversion program. I can go on and on, but my, my approach is, is often policy uh, related in a way that's going to address the structures that are holding youth back in our society. You think about education. We need wraparound uh, 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 support systems for our black students. Of course, that's not individually focused, but what that does is actually to cure it at a very structural level. Not cure it, but you know what I mean? It addresses the problem. As I said at the end of my talk, you know, we have to realize that racism is a structural problem and you have to deal with it. Uh, you have to have structural solutions. And I, I know I'm going a little bit around in circles, but I'm trying to connect to the best way to help uh, African Canadian youth in our society. And I believe that these are some of the initiatives that would really help them. Okay, thank you. So um, in your presentation, you mentioned a study that found that diversity training did not have long lasting results. And one study that found that after three years, racial prejudice was worse within an organization. Were you thinking of a specific study? Yeah, there are, I actually can't. There are a number of those studies. There are longitudinal studies uh, and actually 10 year studies, not three years. But after 10 years, uh, I'm thinking in one study in particular, but I don't know the author at the moment. I haven't remembered the author. If somebody wanted to email me and then they want to know that study, I could, I could get, it, get it to them, get them in touch with that. But the gist of it is that uh, after 10 years, you know, uh, uh, those organizations which that primarily focused on diversity training are worse now than they were before. Diversity training is has been shown not to be effective. If you think of police services, <laughs> for, for one thing, diversity services never uh, uh, function uh, uh, well in a, in a police service. It, it partly because if I can be, be indulged here, uh, partly because diversity doesn't mean anything. Uh, diversity can be different colored fingernails, you know what I mean? So diversity is not connected to a, a, a fundamental value that changes the structures of uh, vulnerability in our society. That's why I suggested earlier that when you think of things like diversity, you have to place them in a human rights context because the human rights context shows you the vulnerable diversities in our society. Uh, human rights context talks about race, it talks about ethnicity, it talks about age, uh, and it protects those categories, disability. And those are the kinds of diversities that need to be protected in order for society to be uh, 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 egalitarian or, or equity based. So that has to do with connecting diversity to uh, human rights assault on power, you know, human rights ability to counteract power differences in our society. Okay, thanks. So I think that that probably answers the next question. The person had said, Dr. Foster, would you please elaborate on why you say cultural competence is better than diversity training? Yeah, I, let me say a little more about that then because cultural competence training really is an inward focus. Uh, it, it really uh, forces you to examine your own community values and, uh, and, and perspectives. And that way, you, by coming to understand yourself, you're able to be more receptive to differences. That's the way that it, it sort of unfolds. Uh, because when you can see your own limitations, you can be more uh, respectful and acceptance, like accepting of the differences of others. That's the fundamental uh, uh, context in which 
uh, 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 cultural competency training works. It's not like cultural sensitivity. Before, 20 years ago, they used to talk a lot about cultural sensitivity and have cultural sensitivity training. So you can kind of, uh, uh, you know, be more respectful towards or more acceptant, tolerant of, of differences. Uh, cultural competency training, actually, if it's, if it's uh, taught and, and absorbed and, and internalized well, goes farther than simply tolerating differences. It becomes actually uh, 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 accepting differences as part of, accepting someone's difference as very fundamental to uh, 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 an organization. Okay, Th thank you for that. Um, so the other questions have to do also, you know, with an elaboration on diversity training. And I feel that, um, if there are other in-depth questions, feel free to, um, to email Dr. Lauren Foster at York University. Um, we are just about closing in about one minute, but I just wanted, um, I'm just gonna ask a last question comment that, that somebody said. You mentioned that people like to hire people like themselves. When we speak of diversity, is it true diversity? Many times institutions hire black or racialized people but they are mere tokens that are in that are intact, upholding the status quo. How do we hire disruptors, or at a minimum, hire to get diversity of thought? Ah, uh, get diversity of thought. Mm. That that is the goal. If you can get diversity of thought and get diversity of perspectives, I do believe you have real diversity. Yes. That, that, that that's qualitatively different than having. Diversity by the number, which I mentioned, yes. which, you know, just having bodies there. There have been a number of studies that have shown that, you know, uh, the whole concept of a diverse organization is can be deceptive in the sense that uh, uh, mostly or, or oftentimes in organizations, uh, the, the people who are racialized, while they make up a, a significant portion of the uh, work. Uh, 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 body and population, they usually are at the lower levels of that organization. So they could be an administration, uh, they, they could be top heavy in administrative low paid work as opposed to managerial work. So, uh, you know, that, that, that's one place where diversity kind of doesn't really tell the tale of, of the tape, so to speak. You have to, be, I mean, being a disruptor, first of all, my experience is having the numbers, basically having the facts, having evidence-based uh, 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 data that you can present to make arguments uh, 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 with, with management in order to show them uh, that the gaps and the and the and the disadvantages that your your workforce has, so that becomes the. Uh, I, I mentioned this in my earlier talk. That becomes a tool for your in your arsenal for uh, social change and uh, or organizational change as well. Uh, but we're all moving in those directions. Well, I mean, I mean, today, racialized people seem to be in various walks of life, attempting to negotiate uh, these uh, uh, inequities that are, are being exposed, as I said, by uh, COVID and, and other factors in life. Uh, we're all trying to negotiate them. And we should be thinking about even disruptors and activists, they should be thinking about transforming that disruption into policy. They should be thinking about things like we're doing at York University, creating programs for uh, special programs. It's allowed under human rights law, special programs to hire blacks to address that disadvantage proactively. At York University up until last year, I believe it was, uh, and we had to get the numbers for this. We didn't even know 
uh, the number of professors that work there. There are 16 black professors at York University a year ago in a population of 55 to 60,000 people. It's just, it was totally uh, uh, bizarre comes to mind, but it's worse than bizarre. But, but once we had those numbers as disruptors, as activists, we're able to create a conversation with the management, with the administration in such a way as that uh, we could, I mean, we're all on the same, we all have the same facts now that can't be denied. And we're able to convince them to create the special program that that is a problem, particularly with a student population, which is majority racialized. It is a problem not to be representative, representative in your professorial ranks. And we showed them the evidence of that. And now we've created this program and they are hiring as we speak 16 more professors. I know it's, I don't even think that's enough, but that is a program which is going to make a difference. Uh, they're doing this at the student level and they're doing it at the graduate student level too. I, 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 could, I don't know how much time we have, but there are programs that exist now, special programs and initiatives to be able to redress that inequity in, in society. Those are the kinds of things that I believe that uh, young uh, African Canadians should be doing in their workplaces uh, and uh, where they live and where they work. They should be thinking about ways that to redress those issues, to redress that inequity through uh, 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 the laws, you know, the human rights laws that we have, special programs, special initiatives, uh, 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 to be able to change things. Oftentimes it's incremental, as I, as I suggested, but you know, as a, a famous uh, a, a reverend, black reverend once said, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the, the arc of history is towards uh, <laughs> equality and democracy. And uh, we, we'll get there. Okay, so thank you all for your questions. Uh, this is where I will close the question and answer and we will wrap up the session. On behalf of Vaughan Public Libraries, Dr. Foster, I would like to thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you to all of you for taking the time to, to participate in this lecture. We hope to see you again on October the 26th for our next lecture on community policing with Superintendent Ricky Virapan of the York Regional Police. Registration is now available on Eventbrite and the link has been posted in the chat. So good night all and keep safe and keep well.